Hello, everybody. So I will present today um, work we have done uh, in the past uh, years, adding 4K um, TCP, and TCP receives zero copy. So a bit of history by, uh, about zero copy in TCP. We had uh, zero copy on the transmit side for quite a long time. Um, the traditional uh, way of doing zero copy is obviously send file because this is what was used by web server back in the days where the content was static. A lot of content was static. Uh, so send file historically on Linux has been implemented on top of Splice, which is a set of infrastructure to manipulate page uh, around pipes and many consumers, providers. And so, for example, uh, on top of Splice, you can implement VM Splice, which is basically a way to um, implement a zero copy, uh, not using a source stored on disk, but source stored on memory. Back in Linux 4.14, uh, Lin uh, William added a message zero copy flag to the generic send message system core. So instead of using splice games, which are, which might be a bit uh, complex, uh, application can just use send message. Um, one of the problem of send message in a transmit is a way for application to know where a particular piece of memory can be reused, like freed or recycled for another use. And so William added um, completion notification on the socket error queue so that uh, an application could uh, use send message and then later use the receive message on the, to read the error queue to get the completions notification. So the send message system call is slightly more efficient than the splice uh, in terms of um, having to lock the socket for every page added because splice set of uh, infrastructure manipulate uh, page one by one. So basically TCP send page is basically called for every single page at a time. So that's, um, that's a bit complex because the sock lock uh, the socket lock is actually like a semaphore, so every release has to relock again the spin lock and release the spin lock. For hardware um, features needed for the transmit side, it's basically uh, no features at all. The only thing you need is scatter getter and uh, checksum offloading. So it has been there for quite a while. A lot of NICs do support uh, zero copy and the transmit quite easily. So now to the topic we are handling today, uh, zero copy on the receive side. Uh, if you are really interested into the optimal performance of a single TCP flow um, with 100 gig and more speed you now have on the link rates. Um, the bottleneck is really the copy we have in the receive message. So, so in this particular example, uh, if you try to reach the maximum throughput you can get uh, for 100 gig nick um, on the current generation of uh, Intel CPU, you basically are limited to 18 gigabits per second. And the bottleneck is the receive side in this case, and the receiver is spending about 70% of the cycles doing just the copy from kernel to user. So how to solve that if, if we want? Sometime you could say, oh, it would be nice to eliminate, eliminate all the copy. Uh, so yes, what about MMAP, right? Um, the problem of MMAP is that 
once you get memory mapping from the kernel to user, you basically lend to the user the ability to uh, read an arbitrary byte into a single page. And the page size is architecture dependent. So, and so for example, uh, let's take PowerPC with 64 kilobyte page. It's going to be very hard to implement zero copy for PowerPC because it turns out that uh, there is no single uh, datagram that could fill completely a 64 kilobyte page. So it's not going to work on poor PC. But you know, uh, maybe it's not a big deal because uh, at least for Google, many servers are actually using 4K as a page size. So all this work is really tied to the 4K page uh, choice. So sometimes um, the size of the individual uh, packet is not a big deal because LRO is supposed to coalesce the payload of multiple incoming packets into a, a set of page. Uh, and so you could say um, whatever segment size the sender is using, the receiver is able to coalesce multiple payload in order payload segment into a contiguous piece of memory. And so maybe you could also get um, zero copy if you happen to fill all the page with the appropriate choice of number of segments, okay? But um, we don't use LRO, right? Uh, many modern NICs don't really handle LRO at line rate speed if they implement LRO at all. So what we chose instead was to really uh, up the MCU so that every single NSS fully uh, filled NSS would be exactly four kilobytes of memory for the payload. Okay, so now we decided to use four um, kilobytes for the payload. What about headers? Um, yes, you could say, because, you know, TCP uh, or the network header can have variable size. For example, if you are using IPv4 or IPv6, obviously the size of the network header is different. And even with TCP, uh, the size of the TCP option can vary uh, based on uh, the dynamic of the, uh, the flow, like the SAT blocks, if you have uh, losses on the network, something like that. So, um, yeah, so it would be nice if uh, the size of the headers wouldn't matter, right? But unfortunately it does because some NIC don't really have the ability to split the header and the data into different zones and different pieces of memory. What we, why do we want to split the memory? Because uh, it would be nice if uh, the application don't have to worry about uh, headers at all, right? Uh, the application doing a receive message normally on the TCP socket just receive a payload and uh, the, the headers are completely hidden uh, unless uh, the application use a socket option to reach address, something like that. So the problem we had to face was that Google had um, many, many different servers generation uh, with different NIC uh, providers. And so some NIC could do some header data split and others couldn't. For example, uh, we use a fair number of servers using the Mellanox um, 4 driver. And uh, Mellanox 4 doesn't implement uh, native uh, header data split. So instead we had to implement uh, pseudo header data split. And this was possible because the Melanox hardware has the ability to store incoming packet into up to four different um, segments. And you can precisely size each of them. And so noting that a lot of our packets in the Google fleet are actually IPv6 and TCP packets and that we are using the TCP timestamp option. 
Um, it turns out that for 99% of the packet, uh, the size of the headers is a well-known value of 86 bytes, which are the 14 bytes of Ethernet plus 40 bytes of IPv6 plus 32 bytes for the TCP with 12 bytes of options. So the change in Mellanox for driver, which is not upstream yet, um, was just to size the first segment to 86 bytes and the second segment to be 4K. And so the driver just, instead of attaching to each reescape two fragments, uh, which would be a bit stupid, right? We just copy the 86 byte of the headers into the SKB head and then we attach a singular page into the SKB before feeding this SKB to the JRO stack. So what happens with other packets? So packets not using IPv6 plus TCP, whatever. So for example, if you receive an IPv4 packet with UDP or TCP, uh, the headers will be smaller, right? So uh, no big deal. It means that the SKB head will contain a bit of payload and the remaining of the stack is just happy with that. Uh, the, TC, the UDP or TCP or whatever protocol receive message will copy uh, whatever bytes are in the SKB head and or in the page fragment. In case the headers are bigger than 86 bytes, no big deal at all. The zero or the IP layer or TCP layer or whatever layer will actually pull the missing bytes from the page frag to the SKB head on demand. But the point here is that 99% of the packets are exactly uh, meeting this uh, 86 bytes magic value. And so another issue we had at Google was that Audonix were using implementing header data split, but <laughs> they couldn't really uh, implement a scatter gather. And so, meaning that because we had to size the, the, the frame content to an exact page size to limit ourselves to normal order zero allocation, we had to limit the payload to 4K. And so combined with the Mellanox 4 uh, constraints, uh, we have this combination of header size, payload size, and the size of the combination, right? So in the case, TCP has to increase the TCP header size because it adds another option to the TCP timestamp option, like a SAC block, something like that. Then we have also to reduce the payload uh, of this segment. And that's fine because TCP just handles us very nicely with the MSS option, IDB MSS option. So if a data packet carries not uh, usual options, then uh, the payload won't be exactly 4K. And that means that the receiver might not be able to use zero copy for this kind of packets. So what are the actual change we did in the routing configuration to make that happen? Um, first, we decided to, even if we increase the MTU uh, on the, the, the various host, host and switch and whatever, we couldn't make sure that all the switch, all the fabrics were updated at once. So we had to do progressive deployments. And so we chose to let the default MTU, default route MTU to be the 1500 byte MTU. And we selectively enabled the 4K TCP traffic for specific destinations. And so we upgraded the cluster one by one. And so this slide presents roughly the, the configuration we set on the device with a big M2, arbitrary big M2, because the driver might limit the actual configuration because of order zero constraints uh, allocation. 
And then the default root uh, route here is 1500 byte MTU. And then we have some specific rule to enable TCP traffic only to use another set of uh, routes enabling the bigger MTU and an IDVMSS set to 4108 bytes. Why we did that? Because we wanted both sides to be enabled, right? You can't uh, uh, enable 4 m on one side only. So we relied on the fact that TCP exchange the IDVMSS option on the SYN and SYNAC packets. And one thing we did also was to be able to fall back immediately to the standard MTU uh, whenever we detected some issues with one of the packets we sent. And so by doing so, we had tremendous results by switching the MTU for, from 1500 byte to 4K MTU, obviously because you receive the number of packets you have to monitor both on the SAN and the receive side. But it also exhibits some benchmark issues because of some heuristics uh, done in TCP stack. For example, one of them is the delay DAC. So whenever TCP receives a single segment, usually um, it will not send an immediate hack because there is this rule about TCP sending one hack for every two packets. So if you receive a single packet, you just wait a bit to send the hack in hope to receive the second packet. But so if you have a workload sending the RPC of 2000 bytes, for example, with the standard MTU, you are actually sending two packets, right? And so by receiving these two packets, you send an immediate hack. But now if you have 4K MTU, then these two kilobyte packets is alone. And so TCP enters this heuristic of not sending an immediate hack. And some benchmark can uh, not deal properly with that because you know there are benchmarks and so they just measure some numbers. And if you change these numbers, they look bad for some reason. Another issue uh, on TCP sender side is that TCP has this um, way of cooking SKB, which are put in the transmit queue before they are actually sent. And the way it works is that we divide a maximum number of bytes that can be set in the IP datagram, which is 64K. And you do, we divide that by the MSS value to get a number of segments per SKB. So if you use a 1500, 1500 byte MQ, it leads to about 45 segments per TSO packet. Each segment can carry 1428 bytes on IPv6. And 4K MQ leads only to 250, right? And so you have a slight uh, difference in the overall occupancy of one TSO packet. And that could matter if you have a workload sending something like, you know, the packet with 62 kilobytes or 62,000 bytes, because before it was sent as a single TSO packet and after going to 4K, then now it's two packets with the second one we very, very small. Uh, another issue we had was um, by switching the, the, the MTU to 4K, uh, it means that the NIC on the receive side has to allocate 4K uh, fragments instead of 2K. And it's fine if you receive traffic using this full 4K, but if you are receiving normal traffic, 1500 byte MTU traffic, because the sender was not updated yet, or the network was not updated yet, uh, it reduced the, the, the overall occupancy of one fragment. And we have this notion of a ratio between the true size of the SKB, which is the memory size allocated, divided by the SKB length, which is the occupancy of the frame. And if this ratio is lowered by 50%, in this case, TCP might end up uh, sending a smaller receive window um, cannons. And it has an impact on the maximal throughput you can get uh, on long distance throw. So th there was a period of time where when we adopted uh, 4KMD where 
uh, we knew that uh, some uh, workload would be hurt for some time. In terms of API, um, first, when I implemented the uh, TCP map call, I just did a patch with a map call, and then um, LKML um, reviewers were not very happy about that, and then we changed that um, later to give two operations. The first one being the MMAP system call, which is basically reserving a space in the VMA on the user process, which will make sure that a future mapping will be only on the read-only um, operation. Again, because when uh, you receive traffic over on NIC, the SKB frags are read-only because they could be shared by another user like TCP dump. TCP dump or packet capture could, you know, get a handle around this page and you don't want to change them because that could uh, change the packet capture. And so after that, the second operation is the get sub option, uh, which is doing the actual mapping um, based on the content of the queue and uh, based on the fact that all the page, all the, the SKB contained in the receive queue are candidates to mapping. So the raw results are quite good because instead of 80 gig, uh, the being limited by the zero, the, the copy in the kernel, we can now reach a line rate easily. And it seems that we could probably reach 200 gig uh, line rate. Uh, the problem is I don't have such need right now, so I can't uh, tell that. So one of the me, or one, we have many issues with the, the, the zero copy. Zero copy uh, is all about memory management uh, issues. And for example, you have this um, map semaphore, which was converted to map lock recently, um, which has to be uh, grabbed every time a process does a map system call or an map system call. And so if you have a multi-threaded application, uh, all the threads might compete to, to onto this map um, lock, uh, read, write uh, lock. Another issue is the cost of the TLB invalidation. So at the time you want to release the, the mapping you did in the past, um, you might have to signal all the CPU that the mapping is gone um, because you want uh, the user, other user trend, trying to still reference the whole mapping to get a segmentation fault. And this TLB invalidation is hugely expensive because it sends an IPI to all CPU uh, involved in this uh, workload. Another issue we have is the lack of um, transparent huge page. So for example, why it matters? If you are receiving um, 60 kilobytes of data using receive message system call, um, if the application is using a huge page for the map for the data portion in user space, then the copy will not trigger any TLB uh, uh, fault because it can be all mapped into a single page. If you are using zero copy, because we mapped single 4K page, then this 60 kilobyte data will map to uh, 15 page. And so that's an additional cost of the TLB cost right after the, the, the mapping has been done. Another issue we had was about XDP because XDP was for a while uh, limited to 4K uh, frame. And so this frame had to be the size of the headers plus the payload. There, there was no concept of uh, header data splits and XDP for quite a while. And of course, uh, another issue with the zero copy stuff is that um, holding page in user space after the map operation uh, is defeating the page pool uh, page recycling heuristic done by the various NIC, right? So the page pool recycling is really uh, a way for the NIC driver to constantly reuse the page 
knowing that the consumer of the SSKB already released uh, its own page ref. So by the time you are trying to reuse this page, um, you look at the page count, and if the page count was returned to one, it means that you are the only user of this page, and you don't have to do the page free and page alloc, uh, which is very expensive. Why it's expensive? It's expensive because um, all the memory management zones are protected by their own spin lock. So if you have a lot of CPU sharing the, the same NM zone, uh, you can hit a uh, spin lock contention on, on this. And last but not least, of course, if the application needs to access the data right after doing the receive, uh, from the receive uh, queue of the socket. Um, avoiding the copy might not be very, very useful because only the first copy is expensive. The second one is the most free because the data is already in the CPU cache. So zero copy is nice if you can really remove all the copies, but as long as you have one copy somewhere, uh, the gain of zero copy won't show up yet. So we had to do some optimization in the stack to make full use of the zero copy. Um, first thing was trying to uh, reduce the number of acquisition of the map block, right? So, because when you do receive message call, if you do uh, receive for every incoming SKB, it's not a big deal because you only hit a local socket spin lock and so there is no contention there because each user has its own socket. If you do, however, the mapping operation um, on a multi-thread program, every time you try to grab some something from the receive queue of the socket, you will have to map to grab the, the map block semaphore in read, uh, read access. So that might be uh, a contention point. So really here you want to avoid um, the number of system call to, to do this uh, map blocks uh, acquisition and uh, transfer of the page from the receive queue to the user VMA. Another issue we had was to, because many RPC are not exactly a, a multiple of four query, right? The, the very often the last segment is incomplete, it's not fully four k but arbitrary number of bytes. And so we had to implement uh, in the zero copy system core a way to transfer this uh, reminder, this 4K, up to 4K minus one bytes, uh, and not having to do a second system core receive message to only get this content. Um, we also implemented uh, the VM insert pages, uh, meaning that we could insert uh, multiple pi page at, at once and to reduce the PT spin lock acquisition cost. Another uh, performance issue was that the original map operation and TCP I did uh, two years ago was um, a combined system core trying to unmap a prior content and then map the new one and it turns out that unmapping the prior content while holding the socket lock is not very good because it prevents bottom half under to feed more packets to, into your socket while you are doing this potentially expensive MM operation involving TLB invalidation. So a bit of credits here. Um, Eric Dumaze, Andy Lutomorski did the first implementation, and uh, Arjun and Sohail did many improvements in um, this uh, memory, this TCP zero copy stuff. Uh, uh, some of them are not yet upstream, but uh, hopefully they will in the in the near future. That's it. Time for questions now. Okay, uh, thanks, Eric. So, um, yes, if you want to uh, read something amusing, go back in time and look at some of Linus's comments when people were proposing uh, page flipping. 
as a way to do zero copy. So the idea was uh, reading to uh, some virtual address uh, a size of a page, we would flip it, um, flip the physical address. And Linus's uh, uh, arguments were kind of interesting um, in a very animated way. Uh, the obvious TLB issues and things like that. But one of the things that I think uh, you kind of mentioned, when we do a copy, uh, say from the kernel to user space, we're actually populating the cache with the data. So if the application turns around and accesses the data, then um, there was no there was no loss in doing the copy because you really get in the, the um, cache population. So I'm wondering, in this case, it's, it's very clear if there's no access in user space, it's a win. But then the question is, what what sort of applications uh, benefit from this that don't access the data after they, they get it from the kernel? I'm sorry, I had some kind of uh, audio breakage, so. Okay, so uh, what's, what's the application for zero copy that uh, is getting benefit? Um, so I'm not sure I can comment on this. Uh, really, I, I try to make uh, some very generic uh, presentation. I can't really say anything about uh, what are the actual use at Google for this uh, technology yet, I'm sorry. But, but but there's the general use cases, right? Which is storage is one, as uh, Jesse pointed yeah, out. Yeah, I really think the, 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 uh, we, we want the technology to enable a fully zero copy uh, behavior, like between uh, a NIC and between a storage unit, something like that. If you can really avoid uh, uh, the copy from kernel to user and then kernel to, to user to kernel, that's a huge win. Uh, and I wanted to add a comment there, Eric and uh, uh, Tom, that the, the caching, the cache effect is actually very, obviously very real, but it's also temporal, right? If you are pulling in like a megabyte of data, yes, if you touch it right away, that's good. But if in time you've done it later, your cache locality has already been moved past. So just because I'm using the data right after is not sufficient. It also needs to be while the cache is still hot which may or may not be true because your, your transfer patterns and your application patterns may or may not overlap. Uh, yes, uh, it, it's obviously a complex issue. Um, I think the, the argument that uh, reading into user space and then turning around and sending it back into the kernel with, with Splice is, is pretty compelling. Um, so let's see, we have a couple questions about uh, page allocation. So why limit order zero pages? Uh, there was quite a bit of discussion on this, but maybe we can summarize. Yeah, so really, the having, having worked for more than eight years at Google, I can tell that um, high order allocation don't do that. That's that's guaranteed to fail at some point. So you don't do that, or you don't let your friends do that, really. Okay, so that's pretty uh, clear advice. So uh, I assume we'll follow it. Uh, XDP, so um, I guess there's, there's two questions here. So, so first of all, obviously you want this to be compatible with XDP, but then follow-up would be how can XDP help or, or would it have any uh, place in, in helping with this? Yeah, so definitely the, 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 the XDP problem has been a problem for me because uh, when I was working, for example, on the Mellanox uh, driver, uh, I was clearly um, in the middle of the XDP way of uh, handling the receiver packets. So I couldn't really upstream my work because uh, there was quite a lot of work in XDP land at that time. And so it means that um, uh, the current way of XDP being, uh, you know, deep inside the driver makes uh, anything, any new development quite harder now. So I was hoping the XDP situation was uh, about to be stabilized because there are definitely efforts trying to cope with multi-segment uh, packets. So hopefully we'll get that and we can upstream this uh, patch. Okay. 
Let's see. Um, so the the interesting thing about the 86 byte, um, clearly that was a kind of a heuristic, right? And in the general case, obviously not all sites can assume that there's a single packet size. Uh, do you have any insights on on how to make that generic? It, it seems like we have to change the hardware to to be able to parse packets. I'm not sure there's a way around that. Yeah, uh, I think uh, if you want something is generic, then you need some kind of uh, header split, uh, header data split on the NIC. Uh, otherwise, you are going to use some tricks we did uh, with this uh, Melanox NIC. Um, Obviously, for us, it's, it was not a big deal because everything is IPv6 since, uh, I don't know, two years or more. So it's uh, there was no real heuristic to take for us. So that was quite easy. OK. Uh, so I haven't seen any hands being raised. Um, so thank you. Let's go on and proceed to the next talk.